so we're coming to the near the end of this first uh, essay, Hasidic discourse, which is written in this book, Torah Or, by the first Rebbe of Chabad. And its purpose is to explain the deep hidden meaning <clears throat> that's relevant to us, to our soul, to our service of God, which is found in the Torah. Every sentence of the Torah is packed with directions and meaning and inspiration and motivation and how to serve the creator of the universe, how to come to love God, the creator of the universe that took the Jews out of Egypt, how to have a personal intimate relation because he's creating us, he's creating me, he's creating you, he's providing for us. But most important is that he's giving us the greatest gift of all, and that is responsibility. Every human being is responsible, and it begins with the Jews. So we're responsible to the creator of the universe to act, think, speak, feel in the proper way. <clears throat> Here we go. <clears throat> Just like a, 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 any anyone that's part of a uh, uh, of, of any group that's larger than himself, he's expected certain degree of loyalty and to obey by the rules, right? You work in a business, you're on a, you're on a, in an orchestra, <coughs> you, you're on a sports team, you're a part of an army of a, of a, you work in a hospital, whatever you are, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer. There are certain <coughs> loyalty, which is, is necessary and a certain code of <coughs> deeds and acts and, and values that you have to have well, the same thing with the biggest of pic old pictures of all is the, why we're here in this world. Where we're put in the world and here we are. And the fact that we're here means that God chose us to be alive. Jew or not Jew. And that's what the Jews are chosen for. The Jews are chosen for <clears throat> this purpose to educate the world to exactly that, to how important they are in the eyes of God. Okay, and, but the Jews, a little bit more is expected of them. And that's why the Jews were given the Holy Temple. The Jews were given the Holy Temple, which this added on <clears throat> hundreds of, of new obligations as far as action and deed and speech and attitude goes. <clears throat> but on the other hand, it showed a tremendous closeness of us to God. <clears throat> like a person who is, is chosen to be the chief assistant of the king of the country. We don't have any more kings anymore, but used to be a king, and the kings got all corrupt. But our king is the king of the universe. He's ultimately good. He creates us. So how do we do this? So, well, we had the temple. At the time of the temple, as the Jews were like brothers to God, right? They were brothers. And that was symbolized by the two statues that were on the cover of the ark. And they were the face of like two angels, it says. And they were facing one another. And this is a show that we were facing God and God was facing us. Remember, that's what we learned the first few days. But says the Rebbe, since the Holy Temple was destroyed, that's what King Solomon is saying in his song, Song of Songs. It should only be that we, you were a brother to me. Again, me ten chok achli. Here's, here's the sentence. It's the first sentence in the last <coughs> chapter of Shir Hashem. There's only eight chapters. Last century. And so who would give it like in, in the Shurashim, there's no simple meaning. <clears throat> it's all it's all allegory and metaphors. Who will give it? Who would only make it that you were a brother to me, nursing from the breasts of my mother? I find you outside, I would kiss you. Also, no one would disgrace me. Uh, what does that mean? So the Rebbe is explaining. You should be a brother to me. This is the Jewish people requesting from God, please build a third temple. And now we're in the time of exile. Please be a brother to me like you were in the time of the third temple. React to what we do. Give us inspiration. Give us blessing. Reveal your holiness and your creative power and your love in the world to everybody. Let everybody feel it. 
You should only be like a brother to me. the Jewish people first, though, because the Jewish people have this tremendous obligation to fix the world. We will both nurse from the breasts of my mother. What is it talking, says the Rebbe? That's talking about the Torah, and especially the interpretation of the rabbis of the Torah. <clears throat> we did, I think we did this yesterday, yes. Says, right, that's talking about the, the oral Torah with you. That's what's talking about the oral Torah. Those people who watched yesterday's class will see that I did not really, um, uh, I did not really have uh, control over the, the machine over here. So there was a lot of times that I was talking and I thought I was pointing to something, but it was just a picture of me. Because it, for some reason, the other one didn't flip on. Anyway, I hope you got the point. The words were there anyway. The words were there. The pictures wasn't. So that's what's called the written. The written Torah is the, called the wisdom of my father. The, the, <clears throat> the oral Torah, the explanation of the Torah, the Torah Shabal Peh, the Talmud, from all these great rabbis, <coughs> the Talmud, says that most of them had the power to raise the dead. That is nevertheless called the wisdom, that's called the understanding of my mother. Understanding of my mother. And that, a second, let me turn this. <clears throat> and that's learning nowadays by learning the Talmud, by learning the Midrash, the Halas, <clears throat> how the written Torah is explained properly by means of learning this is that means that we are, God, that's what God decided, right? God decided that when we learn the Torah, because the Torah is his wisdom and his understanding, so when we get it inside of him, so we are, so to speak, when we get it inside of us, when we get these ideas, we learn the Torah, we understand them. So this puts us, so to speak, on the same footing as God. We're equal, we're like brothers. Huh? So that's the importance of learning the Torah, when you learn the Torah now, true, we don't have a holy temple. It's not exactly the same thing. <clears throat> but in a way, it's even more internal. It's more internal. We take the ideas of the Torah take the, and understand them. You don't have to learn the whole entire tractate. Learn one idea of the Talmud. One idea of the Talmud. Understand it well. That idea is God's wisdom. Huh? Hard, to, hard, to, hard to believe, but it's harder to believe that <coughs> God is creating us. He's creating everybody all the time. That's even harder to believe. That the Torah is God's wisdom. And because God is eternal, so this is what God is thinking right now. And we got it inside of us. That's what it says. Anyone who learns laws every day is promised that he will be have a place in the world to come. Like it explains along, okay, and so that, okay, after that, it says, so it says, you should be a brother to me. We understood what that means. It means that we are on the same, so to speak, level of God as God. God reacts to us. We react to him. Like the two statues on the nursing from the, the breasts of my mother means that now that we're in exile, at least we can nurse, nurture, suckle from the breasts of the mother. What is the breast of the mother? Understanding the, 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 the Talmud. The Talmud is called the breasts of my mother because mother represents understanding and the Talmud is understanding ideas of God. That's what we have now. Right? The Torah is God's will, God's wisdom, even the opinions of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi, and Rabbi Tarfun and Hillel and Shammai and all these people that seem to be people just like us. And they are people just like us. Moses was also a person just like us. But God was speaking through them. Not everybody gets this God speaking through them. A lot of there's a lot of fakers, a lot of fakers, very easy to fake. There's the false prophets, right? And the first temple was filled with them. False prophets. <clears throat> These people, God was really speaking through them, and he was speaking, saying true interpretations of what the Torah is. And so, but, okay, then after that it says, I will find you outside. What does it mean? I will find you outside. This refers to working men. And what about people that can't learn Torah? What about people that haven't got the time to learn Torah? I mean, that's like 99% of the Jews, 
to sit and learn Torah all the time. You have to make money. You have to have a family. There's some people that they go out and work and it just confuses them the whole day. They can't get their minds settled. <clears throat> they can go to a class. <clears throat> says that that's what King Solomon said. You will be to me like a brother. That's in the time of the temple. We should be. How can you be a brother now by learning the Torah, the oral Torah? I we, we you, by means of that we will nurse from the breasts of the mother of my mother. That's the the explanation of the Torah, the Talmud, the Midrash, the laws. I will find you outside. Kai, this refers to Bali Asakin. This refers to working men. Even though she have Shalom, that it is impossible for them to be learning the Torah constantly. And they would be, to, in order to be this level of what says nursing from the breasts of my mother, that's learning the Talmud, we said. That's what King Solomon referred to. By means of Dalet al Mashalacha, or being surrounded by the understanding of the law, it's called the Dalet Amos. The the, the 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 surrounding ideas, the ideas of the Torah surround me, my domain. <clears throat> so a person can't learn the Torah now; he's really messed up, right? Now he's really in a bad situation. We don't have the Talmud, we don't have the, the, the Holy Temple, we don't have the Holy Temple. There's all these fakers and weirdos and false religions and and liars and cheaters and and false prophets, right? And they have millions, billions of followers. And the, the, the only way you can save yourself is by learning the Talmud. And there's some people that they can't learn the Talmud. So we haven't got a temple. We're surrounded by these <clears throat> evil waters. And the, what about learning the Talmud? You can't learn the Talmud either. It's just so confusing. What is a person supposed to do? Mikol Makom, nevertheless. Aleyam, it says, the Mikol Makom, nevertheless, even though you haven't got a temple and you can't learn the Torah. And there's all these difficulties in the world. Nevertheless, and I will find you outside. You can be found outside of learning the Torah, outside of the temple. That's what King Solomon said. How can it be found outside? What does it mean? In the Hine, we find the Kurdish Baruch It also says, Lashon Kone. My God, it says that God is also a businessman. Where does it say? It says, Kone Shemayim Boretz. It says that God took possession. He bought the heavens and the earth. And also the rabbis say, Hamisha Kinyanim Kane Kodesh Baruch There are five possessions in, in Pirti Avot, it says. There are five things that God took possession of. The heaven, the earth, it says Abraham was one of them, the Beit HaMikdash was one. <clears throat> so if so, what does it mean? It means that God pulled something into his domain. That's what, a, that's what it means, taking possession. Konev, to buy. <clears throat> what do you mean you buy something? You go into a store, you give the person money, and you pull this thing, the other thing becomes yours. The thing didn't change. You go and you buy a car. The car doesn't change. Doesn't, it just changes hands. It gets pulled from the, from the store into your garage. Right? But the thing didn't change. It just changed possession. It just changed owners. The same thing, God is also a businessman. He also takes things into his possession. What does that mean? He nay, that, that's what it means that even businessmen, even people that work outside, they can also be close to God, just like brothers. How so? He nay, you can see if it says, or it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Ten Commandments, six days, and the fourth of the ten, fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments, six days God made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Call a Shabbos and <coughs> and every Shabbat that we come to, even though it might be thousands and thousands of days after the creation of the world, right? The world was created five thousand seven hundred and eighty-two years ago and a half years ago, right? And since then, every year has fifty-two Shabbos in it. So multiply five thousand seven hundred and eighty-two by by fifty-two, right? And how much do you get? What is it? 250,000, something like that. You get 250,000 Shabbos. Huh? Is that right? In any case, whatever it is, you get a lot. 250,000 Shabbos there have been. Each Shabbos is called the seventh day. How could each Shabbos be called the seventh day? 
even if there was only just Shabbos, there weren't six more days, this is the 250,000th day. But how is it the seventh day? It says every Shabbos is called the seventh day because this cycle repeats itself. It's a Shabbat to God. So to speak, the seventh day, that goes back to God and it starts the cycle brand new. How can we call the Shabbos now the seventh day? Shari Kavar Avru Ravavas Yamim. So many days. From the beginning, from the creation of the world. Right? The seventh day, 250,000 Shabbos multiply 5,700. Here, one second, I'll have my thing over here. 5,700. Here we go. How many days are there in the week? Look at this. Watch this. I have to get the computer over here. Uh, never, never that strong in, in mathematics, to tell you the truth. Here we go. We have uh oh, 5,782 years times 365. 365, right? So what's the answer? 2,110,430 days have passed since the creation of the world. How can we possibly call this coming Shabbat the seventh day? How can it be the seventh day? Doesn't make any sense. It's at bare minimum the 5,780. 5, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Two, sorry. I make, looked at the wrong number. Two, it's at the very bare minimum, it's the two millionth day of the year of, of, of since creation. Since creation, bare minimum, 2,110,430. So we got four more years to go, 2,110,433. This coming Shabbos will be the two millionth day. How can we say it's, it's not the two millionth day, it's the seventh day. <laughs> what do you mean the seventh day? How can that possibly be? I was alive seven days ago, right? And there was a world, everything, this is not the seventh day. <clears throat> I, was, you know, I was even alive two weeks ago. This should be at least the 14th day. Says the answer, <clears throat> the Hinnim is seen we find by God. It says also, oh, I'm sorry, one second, the thing went back up, went back up. Oh, look here, our first glance, how is it possible to call it the Shabbat now, the seventh day? There's already been tens of thousands of days. Here we said two million day, year, days have gone by since the beginning of the world. Ad Shabbatos, Elu, until these Shabbatot, every Shabbat. I can understand the first Shabbat, when God created the world, it was the seventh day. But the second Shabbat after that, it was the 14th day. And the Shabbat after that, right, it should be the 21st day. So how, how does it work out? These six days, these correspond to the six emotions of God. <clears throat> we said that God has a personality. Well, this is what's called his emotions. Shabbat that by means of them, but all you've done, and through them, God created the world by means of what's called his emotions. The first day, there was light. That corresponds to what's called chesed, God's love. <clears throat> Second day, it says there was a division. That corresponds to God's kavura. Afterwards came the seventh day, Shabbat. Who, aliyotam, all of the days get elevated to their source. Umakorum, in their origin. Lamaila, maila. <coughs> And they, they, all the other days is coming down. On the seventh day, God didn't do anything. Everything just went back up to its source. Kachu gam came bakal Shabbat. That's what happens every Shabbat. The whole system starts over again. Because as we get into the week, we forget that there's a creator. The seventh day is the creator's day. Shabbat Shem said that in the six days of work, who you read, uh, this is coming down of God's emotions from what we talked about before, Atzilut, the highest dimension of creation. That's called Atzilut, pure godliness, into the, the lower dimensions, which are called Bria, Yetzirah, and finally to this world, Asiya, in order what to Borer. Why is God creating the world? <clears throat> God is coming down, his power, every, every week, right? Since the creation of the world, what do we say, 250,000 Shabbos ago, maybe my numbers were wrong, anyway, 250,000 Shabbos ago, 300,000 Shabbos ago, <clears throat> there was <clears throat> 300,000 300, Shabbos ago, God began this process of creating the world 
Why is he, God is creating the world. God himself is creating the world. Why, why is he doing it? He's creating the world constantly, seven days. Why is he doing it? Because in the seventh day, he created man. And God wants man to refine the world. And therefore, God comes into the world and gives man inspiration and power and creation and life in order to, the purpose, to refine the world. And afterwards, on the seventh day, everything goes back up to its source, gets refreshed, right? Like, I mean, the, the football games, you have the quarter time, right? And the coach comes out, says, remember you're, who you're fighting for. Remember who you're fighting against. We must win. And it gives them inspiration. Well, that's us also. We have the seventh day as everything goes back up to it, to the coach, to God. Everything goes back up to its source, Davka, on this day. And this gives us, uh, 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 how do you say, it, uh, a reset a, uh, to remind us who we're, who we're serving, <clears throat> where we're coming from, who's helping us to serve God. Says that's the seventh day. The seventh day, everything goes back up to its source. But this is only for the Jews now. This is only for the Jewish people. Shabbat is purely for the Jewish people. The Ten Commandments, true, were given for all mankind, but not all the commandments that are in there are <clears throat> for all mankind. <clears throat> Especially the commandment of Shabbat. Shabbat is only for the non, for only for the Jews. Shabbat. <clears throat> Afterwards, on Shabbat, everything goes back up to its source. Davka, Biyom, Shvis, on the the day, and on this aspect of the seventh day, which this is what's called God's kingship, <coughs> everything goes back up to its source. Vezeo, that's what it means, Vayachul Washamayim. That's when God takes possession of everything. We see that God is a businessman. He invests his energy seven days, six days, and the seventh day, he takes possession. That's what it means. Be'yachulu lashon kalata nafshi. It says on the seventh day that God finished, but the word kalato means to finish, but it also means to have desire. Uh, and you say longing. Kalata nafshi. My soul goes back up. Like we saw, l'cha dodi likrat kala. Kala means the ability to go back up. Boi kala. We say that the, the, the Shabbat is called the bride of God, but the word kala also means to expire, to go up, to have longing. <clears throat> Therefore, Omrim, it says, in one of the blessings, in the blessing we make after we eat, um, <clears throat> like uh, the fruits of, er of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, uh, or wine, there's a special blessing which is called me'ayin sheva. No, no. No, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. No. <clears throat> we say <clears throat> after um <clears throat> right. Oh, we don't say this. In Chabad, we don't say this. Some people say there's a blessing which is called Ma'in Sheva. It says Kone Shamayim Oritz. That God Kone, it says it other places also, but in any case, Kone Shamayim Oritz, that God possesses the heavens and the earth. We say it also after Shabbat. We say it after Shabbat in the blessing. One second, one second. And just when the blessing, give me one moment here. One moment. One moment. I know we say this after Shabbat. One second. Uh, no, 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 no. Shamri Yisrael says Shabbat. Where is this? One, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. One moment. One moment. No, it's not here. Oh, no, no, no. This we say in in the the the. I get it. 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 <clears throat> yes, yes. Mali Shabbat. Right. I'm I'm sorry. I, I got confused a bit. <clears throat> in the prayers, the first prayers of Shabbat, the nighttime. Prayer of Shabbat. When Shabbat comes in, when we finish the prayer, we say a blessing, <clears throat> which is something like the blessing, the the Shmon as we say on Shabbat, and it ends Kone Shemayim Oritz, that God takes possession of the heavens and the earth. What does it mean? Takes possession of the heavens and the earth. 
Oh, there we say, and the Ma'ain Shabbat, this is the blessing we say after the evening prayer of Shabbat, <clears throat> which repeats the, the seven blessings that we say in the standing prayer of Shabbat. So it says, Kone Shemayim, or it's the God takes possession of the heavens and the earth. Because that's the whole thing of Shabbat. Hine Eliot Olamod. That's the whole thing on Shabbat. So to speak, on the six days of the week, God pays <clears throat> for the world, he puts energy in, and on Shabbat he takes possession. That's what it means that everything which was refined in the six days of <clears throat> the week it is raises up and it's included in Shabbat. This is something like taking purchase, like purchasing something, like a businessman takes he, he first of all <clears throat> gives money first, and then after by means of that. He receives afterwards this things that he's purchasing, so to speak, also by means of God putting energy into the world for the six days of creation. And this repeats itself every week. This God puts his energy in. Why? In order to refine the world. It says to raise up the sparks of holiness, which are concealed in the world. By means of this, it comes down <clears throat> on, <clears throat> that on the last day, uh, that everything that we did in the whole week raises up on Shabbat. Me, Turi, the Pruda, from what's called these mountains of separation, like I said before, this turbulent waters of the six days of the week, and it raises up, that's called the, 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 the public domain, the Rishuta Yachid, to the private domain. Yachidu Shalom, the God is the one <clears throat> single one of the world. So it's just like the, 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 the car that's in the dealership, right? It's available to anybody, anybody that wants to. But if you go and pay for it, then it becomes yours. The same thing the world. The world is available for everybody. But God is putting energy into it. And all the, the, the through the Jewish people, and all that the Jewish people <clears throat> work on, and put energy into the world properly as God takes possession of it. When? On Shabbat. That's the whole thing. And that's a, that's in a small way, every six days. So is also, in a big way, the whole exile of the Jewish people. The Jewish people, first of all, when they were in Egypt. Egypt, that's like the weekdays. Everything is by means of... <clears throat> that they, they, they put in this energy, and finally God took them out. He elevated them, raising up the sparks that are falling there. And that's, with it, like for instance... Who are the sparks? Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, Ovadia. These are people that came from converts. By similar when we say Shema Yisrael, it says that you should work in your fields and gather up your wheat. What is this talking about gathering up the wheat? A lot of, most Jews are not uh, farmers. What type of wheat are we supposed to gather up? It says you will gather up, if you do what I say, you'll gather up the wheat. Wheat, who wants to gather up wheat? I go to the store. And I buy bread. Who's gathering up the wheat? Says this is also a metaphor for <clears throat> <clears throat> us working in the world and gathering up the diversion of the world to echad, to the oneness of God, and having love for God. A person, namely, is some people can't learn Torah. Some people are not so good and learning the Torah and understanding and nurturing from the breasts, so to speak, the understanding of God. But what? They can work in the physical world in order to provide for themselves, and their family. This is a tremendous descent from where it's supposed to be. But by means of this, Nasa Akakak, there is made afterwards an elevation. Shemit Palel, when a person prays, in the power, with the power and the energy of the food that he worked for. And he says, God, you were one. Shema Yisrael Hashem, Elokein Hashem Echad. And you come to love God with self-sacrifice because God is creating you. And because God gave us the Torah and God is creating the whole world. 
And we are in the world working in order to unite everything in the world, everything of the creation to the creator. <clears throat> because that's really the truth. That's the way things really are. <clears throat> Therefore, when the, this person works in the world, and when he prays, right, in the morning prayer, the evening prayer, before he goes to sleep, he says, Shema Yisrael, unites everything to the oneness of God, <clears throat> then what happens, it becomes like a, the prayers are called Olat Tamid. It's called like one of the sacrifices, raising up the sparks of the world. Every prayer that a person makes on the weekday, this raises up into the prayers of Shabbat. So if so, we have three ways to serve God in the time of exile. One of them is by means of the commandments. Another one is by learning the Torah. That's the main one. Another one is by prayer. When we work in the world for the working man, and he elevates everything that he's done in the world by prayer. Prayer elevates also the Torah and the commandments also. Praying the Jewish prayers are not really centered so much from asking God for things. That you're supposed to do also. You're supposed to request from God everything that you need. There was one great rabbi that he would sit in before, he would, the, the food would be in front of him. And before he would eat the food, he would pray to God, please God, give me food. Because he knew that God was creating everything brand new every time, every second. <clears throat> If so, that's the idea of prayer, is lifting our energy, our attention, our heart, <clears throat> our trust, our love to our creator. He's creating everything. He's the one that gave us the Torah. <clears throat> that's called elevating. Elevating, like taking a puzzle and putting it together. The little pieces were meaningless. You put it together, oh, there's a big meaning. Suddenly the whole world can become more meaningful. And that's the way the the working man becomes a brother with God. That's what it says. That's what it means that I found you outside. That even the people who are businessmen and they're working in the physical world or they're, 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 what is that? they're plumbers or they're doctors, they're lawyers or they're, they're, they're whatever it is, uh, uh, gardeners, anything that a person does, you work in the world, God is also found outside. Because by means of your work in the world, you raise up what's called sparks of meaning. To the oneness of God. But call Israel and all the Jewish people, they can do this. Shahari, because Dina <clears> the <throat> the law of the Talmud is <clears throat> the Parsha Rishonah, that the first paragraph of Shema Yisrael, Tzaricha Kavani, you have to have the proper intention. At least for the first six words, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Yechad, you have to have intention for God. And that you can't just say it. If so, what does it mean? It means that you're elevating your thoughts to the Creator. That's why it says you put your hand over your eyes when you say Shema. <clears throat> By the way, it says that there was the Chita that said that even non-Jews should say Shema Yisrael. Because the sentence says, listen, Jews, God is our God, God is one that non-Jews should know that the Jewish people are special. They're God's representatives to show that the world is not our world. It's God's world. Well, according to that's what it means that you have to give over all of your life, all of your will to, to the creator when you say that word echad. Listen, Jews, God is our God. God is one echad. This is in every single Jew. Every Jew has this. Sha'av, sha'en, lo nefesh. Every Jew has this desire to completely devote himself, surrender himself to the creator of the universe. And everything that he does, says, thinks. <clears throat> and even though that he doesn't know it, Nevertheless, every Jew has this total self-sacrifice, this total self-devotion to God, whether actually or potentially. Every Jew. Even the most simple of simple Jews is able to give his life for the Creator. 
for Judaism. I'll you there's a, there's, a, oh, there's a lot of stories about Jews that you know that the in, in, in the especially in the uh, <clears throat> the um, Inquisition, the Inquisition, the Crusades, the Inquisition. As far as I know, and this could be wrong, that Hitler was the only one that didn't give the Jews a chance to convert. Usually, the others, the the, the, the Muslims, the Christians, the other, they said, "You convert, we'll let you live." Right, tie them up to the stake. You convert to our religion, we'll let you live. If not, you get burned. There were a lot of Jews that said, Shema Yisrael, burn me. Jews that weren't even religious Jews. And they said, okay, I'm willing to convert. Right? All of a sudden, they tie them up to the stake, and they say, Shema Yisrael, at the last second. What happened? And by means of this, it says, because every Jew has in potential the desire, the ability, the nature to be totally devoted to Hashem and not think about yourself at all. No Jew wants to die. Who wants to die? But at that moment, you're not thinking about dying. You're not thinking about living. You're thinking just about the Creator. I can't go against the Creator. I can't deny my Judaism. <clears throat> well, every Jew has this in potential, not just when he's tied up to the stake, but everything that he does says in the course of the whole day to give his will over to God, to give your will over to God, not to eat lobster, is much less painful than being willing to die on the stake. Every Jew is willing to die on the stake, but there's a lot of Jews that will not give up lobster. That's insane, but that's that's the insanity of the evil imp of the of the selfish impulse, <clears throat> the itzerora. It makes a person crazy, but in fact, every Jew is willing to suffer even death, not to go against God. How much more so to suffer a little bit of discomfort? Right? Every Jew is willing to do, even the most non-religious, anti-religious Jews. <clears throat> as soon as they know that they're Jew, or Jews that don't even know they're Jews, as soon as they know it, it's potentially it's there inside them. That's, the, that's what makes a Jew a Jew. Al-Yudezeb makes a Jew different from everybody else. Different from everyone else. Al-Yudezeb, by means of this, this raises up everything that you did in the week to the one God. In can if so, even your business, even the money that you make, the essek and the work that you put forth in the week to earn money, who Mayan, this is something like, like God, what God does, that God on Shabbat, he takes possession of the physical heavens and earth. <clears throat> Therefore, that's what makes God like a brother to us. In other words, that we do what God does on Shabbat. God takes possession of the world. The same thing when a Jew works in the world and he prays to God, as this is, so to speak, putting everything into God's domain, making us a businessman just like God is. And that's, we're going to see the next one, that's what it means, I will kiss you. In, in Shira Shirim, it's filled with kissing. That's how, the, in fact, the Song of Songs, that's how it starts off. That's how the song starts off. It says, Shira Shirim Asher Lashlomo. Right in the beginning, the first, the beginning, the song of songs, which is the Psalm, the King Solomon. And Yishakeni, he will kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, because your love is better than wine. What does this mean? We're talking about God. It says God will tell us the secrets of the Torah. That's what Rashi explains. He'll tell us the secrets of the Torah, <clears throat> etc. But now we're talking about how we and God can be brothers. And here we're talking about how we can find God and God will find us outside. And tomorrow we'll talk about how God kisses us. What does this mean? That's what it says in, in, in the continuation of the sentence. What does it say? Who will give, if it should only be that you will be a brother to me. We will nurture from the breasts of my mother. I will find you outside. That we said before, that's the businessman, working man. I will kiss you and no one will disgrace me. What does King Solomon mean? I will kiss you. This we're going to find out tomorrow. Now let's learn the Devar Malchut of this week. <clears throat> Talking about the, the making a holy temple and how every Jew is gold and what this has to do with the happiness of the month of Adar. Ready? Let's go.